Welcome back to the Contacts Coaching Podcast. We are joined today by Peninsula legend Wesley Johnson, former Pirate coach, current Cougar coach, former Sun Devil. Wesley, thanks for jumping on the call. Let's get out. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know. Well, coach, let's go through the journey here. How did you land where you are? How'd you get into coaching? Take me through the process of your journey to being in the seat that you're in and all the twists and turns that come along with that. Oh, well, it's quite the story, actually. I kind of started coaching, uh, started coaching fourth grade flag football when I was in high school through the Next Level Sports flag football program. Went to Palma High School. Coach Carnazzo gave us the opportunity to coach and kind of get on that platform. I took a liking to it, enjoyed it a lot. And then there was another program that I was involved in at a Johnson Tony football camp, formerly known as the Herm Edwards football camp. I kind of grew up in, got a little older, embraced the coaching role there. Uh, started there at about 15. And I just, I kind of took a liking to it. I, I liked how the kids responded to me. I liked having fun with those guys and then just sharing that experience with my peers. So kind of got into it that way. Um, going into my senior year of high school football, I was diagnosed with a, a cardiovascular condition, kind of held me to the sideline, but I had a guy behind me uh, that I needed to get ready, you know, sooner than later. So I kind of took it upon myself to get him acclimated as soon as I could, as fast as I could, saw some results in that, uh, built a bond with him, and then when I got into junior college after that, I was, you know, given a good opportunity by by you. <laughs> got into coaching there. I was 19 going to NPC and I was helping out with the uh, JV and varsity football programs at Stevenson, helping with receivers and defensive backs and then also uh, quarterbacks a little bit. And when it was time for me to transfer out to my four-year school, I contacted you know, real Peninsula legend, Herm Edwards, who was the head coach at Arizona State at the time. And he was uh, gracious enough to give me an opportunity to help in recruiting. And from there, I was promoted into the defensive staff, helped there for two years, was working under the uh, names of Marvin Lewis, Antonio Pierce, you know, the guys of that name. So that was really fun. That was a good opportunity. Learned a ton from them. Uh, grew a lot within that workspace. And uh, when it was time for me to graduate, transferred out, got to BYU, and now I'm here as a graduate assistant helping out with the defensive backs and couldn't be happier. I love where I'm at. Awesome. Thanks for setting that up. Let's go back to when you first started doing this and not when you were still in high school, but when you came over here and as a 19-year-old, uh, you're a year removed from high school and now coaching. Um, what did you realize right away that you needed to figure out? <laughs> I realized that I needed to be respected more than I needed to be liked. That was kind of the first thing that resonated with me. I I realized that the players kind of took a liking to me and, and saw that I was kind of like the quote unquote cool young coach, but I needed to set a bar there, set a line, you know, kind of establish myself as an authority figure and just uh, figure out how to best kind of walk that line and still be able to be personable with them, but at the same time have high expectations. So I kind of learned that very soon, and I just realized that I needed to be involved in in the culture setting that uh, Coach Kazmus had set out, and I just kind of stuck to that as best I could. And if it wasn't for me, you know, kind of having those conversations with him, having those conversations with you, and, and embracing that leadership role, I don't think I would be where I'm at without it. And as you transitioned up the ladder, so to speak, right, when you got to ASU, right, and you're still a young guy, right, yeah. and you're still you're still an undergrad, right, even now you're still in grad grad school in theory, right, it's like, how do you, how is that situation where, hey, I, there's got to be boundaries, we're not peers, even though I'm young, like, how right. has that played out as you've uh, gone to different places, uh, how do you maintain that? What things have you learned in regards to establishing those boundaries? And, you know, what have you tried that didn't work? What have you tried that worked for people that are listening to this that maybe are young as well getting into this thing? Well, something that I tried didn't work. 
was probably just trying to be too cool. Like, I, I don't want to say trying to be too cool, but I, yeah, trying to be too cool in a sense, just trying to, you know, be their friend and more so than trying to be the authority figure. But I think as time went on, I kind of realized that I needed to set expectations for them. So I think what helped for me was just goal setting for myself, goal setting for them, uh, holding them to a high standard and then just understanding that, you know, you can always exceed your expectations. So when I had those conversations with those guys on a, on a personable level, because I did have that rapport with the players and just kind of let them know that, look, I, I have these goals set out for you. I want you to accomplish these things. And once they saw that I was holding them to the same standard as the head coach and the full staff, just kind of buying in to the message that was being, uh, you know, passed down, then they kind of understood that, okay, you know, Wes is just as serious about this as, you know, as, as Coach Herm, as, as Coach Kazmus, as, you know, Coach Sataki, where I am now. So just kind of, you know, being able to to be stern and, and to hold those guys accountable. I think I had a hard time having those uncomfortable conversations early on. And I have grown in that, in that uh, aspect of it, just understanding that if I don't uh, be transparent with them and then give them exactly how it is, then I'm kind of doing them a disservice and letting them get away with things that they may not get away with, you know, at the next level, so to speak. So I feel like if I, if I only helped them in football, if I only kind of let them coast and let them do those things that I, I did them a disservice. So I'm just trying my best to, to be a good teacher and then to, said to, to be a good mentor to those guys too. And then leading by example is part of it as well for me. So. So you mentioned that learning that to have those difficult conversations uh, was something you had to grow into. What have you learned about that? What, what did you used to shy away from that now you lean right into because you figured out like it's actually easier to just dive right into the mess. I used to shy away from, from, from the reactions that I would receive from those guys with fear of them uh, not being able to not being able to look at me the same way. Cause I, like I said, kind of a little earlier, I, I was more so fixated on being, like I said, being the cool coach, being liked and, you know, being somebody that they could come to if they just wanted to have a conversation or joke around or whatever the case was. But I think me growing into that and kind of leaning more into that, I, they saw, the level of seriousness that I was taking to it. And they saw the standard that I was holding them to as players. So once I was able to lean into those uncomfortable conversations and have those a little more, they understood what the expectations were, what the standards were, and my intent behind the things that I was doing. I've never, I've never hammered, like get on a guy and then yell at him and yell at him, and yell at him. I'll just, I'll talk to him. If it is stern, then it is whatever it is. But I'll always come up to you after the case, put my arm around you and tell you that I love you, tell you that I understand why you did these things, but here's why we need to do things this way, just for the betterment of the team and then for them, you know, beyond the sport. And what did you learn for yourself upon staring those down right away versus avoiding them that you are now putting into practice as you go through your day to day? I learned that I learned that it was that it was good for me. That it was good for me to be transparent with them. And then I learned that it was giving me more of an opportunity to just be a teacher to them, to lean into those things a little more. And then I also just had a better understanding of of how of how they of how they responded to me. So that was kind of more of it, just seeing, like, they were like, all right, Wes is kind of serious. Like, you know, he's never serious. We got to kind of tighten up a little bit. So they knew what I was expecting of them. And then I just, I learned that I'm okay with having those conversations. The more that I had them, I learned that I, even though it is uncomfortable initially, maybe for both of us, that I know that there's going to be, um, you know, something good that comes out of that conversation. Even though it is uncomfortable, it's going to be beneficial in the end. Well, and also I think you could even speak to this as a player. The thing that I have found to be the biggest concern voiced is 
lack of clear role definition, right? And lack of clear direct communication where they're almost grasping at tra- straws to read between the lines of what you're saying versus you just hit them between the eyes with it. And it's like, okay, now you have clarity and you can operate and walk in partnership together. Yes. Yeah. I, I think being direct, just kind of being straight to the point about it with those guys gave them a better sense of understanding of what we were expecting of them, uh, like what we want to see and then how we should carry ourselves amongst our peers. And then you said moving on outside of sports, because a lot of these things carry over to real life. You know, you're going to have to have uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations in real life. You're going to have to face things that you're not necessarily wanting to lean into in real life, but you realize that once you get through that uncomfortability phase that, you know, there's going to be something good for you in the end of it. What's up, Coach? How are you? Yeah, yeah. No, what? Yeah, no, this is a good room right here. That's where it's at. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's let's pivot to this. So as a offensive guy growing up and playing. Yeah. And after you left here, you found yourself on the defensive side of the ball. Talk a little bit about that transition, how that opened up your eyes to certain things, how that made you a better coach, how that gave you greater understanding of offense or whatever else you've had to figure out over the last three years as you shifted from everything that you had known to, oh, hey, let me go figure this out. Yeah, I mean, it helped me to realize how much I didn't know. So that was part of it, too, just accepting that growth and you know kind of leaning into that challenge but I think converting like going from playing receiver and coaching receivers and then uh, helping with linebackers and then uh, defensive backs and now it just gave me a better understanding of um, what offenses are trying to do schematically so playing defense you know obviously the techniques and the coverages and terminology is different But I think one thing that carried over was just my understanding of what offenses are trying to get out of certain formations, certain uh, route concepts, you know, so I kind of leaned into that a little bit. And that was what I that was what I used to guide me through, you know, the understanding of conceptualizing defense. I think it was tough for me at first. I mean, I'd be lying if I said I had it all figured out now. I definitely don't. But it gave me a good basis. You know, it gave me a good basis of just regards to spacing of routes and spacing of alignments, type of stuff that you can anticipate. And then I was able to, even though I wasn't fully polished in my first few years as a defensive assistant, I was able to offer an offensive perspective to those defensive players. So that carried over. It helped me a ton. And I feel like they respected me because I didn't act like I knew the defense. I just taught what I knew really well. I just stuck to that, and then I would kind of pick I would pick at people's brains, you know, pick at Coach Lewis's brain, and you know, Coach Pierce and, all, you know, AG, Coach Garnett, and just learn from those guys, you know, over time. But those first few years, I just had to lean on my, on my previous knowledge and then kind of pick and pull from those guys as time progressed. What would you say you were able to – transfer let's say from being Mm -hmm. an offensive guy to coaching defense from being with the linebackers to now with the dbs um i obviously there's specific skills to each position but there's probably a lot of transferability as well what are some of the things that you realized uh without necessarily having a plan to do it that like you know what this is the same thing this is how we're going to teach this because it's just easier to pick up that way effort and physicality Effort and physicality carried offense, defense, special teams. If you're giving max effort on offense, you know, running your route to your best ability. Defensively, you're, you know, 11 hats to the football and then special teams and say you're doing your assignment. And then I think another thing that carried over was just understanding, having a better understanding of your, your best understanding of your technique, executing that, and then your pre-snap alignments. I think alignment, assignment, and technique carry over to all three phases of the game. So, that's something that I realized very fast, that if you're misaligned, if you're playing safety and you miss a pick by two yards and you're misaligned, you're off the hash by two yards, you know, that's that's your misalignment. That could be the difference between a 60-yard touchdown and a, and a 60-yard pick six. So I just kind of realized that 
pretty early on, honestly. I saw saw that and then saw the coaching points of just effort and physicality and getting aligned right. And that kind of carries over to, like I said, all the phases of, of the game. What would you say is or is not transferable from the high school to the college game and vice versa, right? So you you cut your teeth coaching high school. You went and coached college. Now, if you were to go back to coach high school, what are some of the things that definitely transfer? And what are some that's just like, look, it's just not, it's not worth the squeeze to try to do this given X. I think, I think in college, you can be a, more of a multiple defense because you're dealing with more mature mature players, more, uh, you know, more experienced players for that, you know, but at the high school level, I think you just have to have a few things that you, that are your core bread and butter and just excel in those rather than trying to do too much. I mean, the same thing at this level, if you do too much, then you're just okay at everything. You're not going to be great at anything. So you just want to be able to, you know, master one kick a thousand times and trying to, and trying to, master a thousand kicks you know it's just put yourself in a better position if you're able to hone in on what you're what you strongly believe in what you know you can coach and then you just apply those to your team and the coach and then the players have a better understanding of what's expected of them and their assignments and their roles and there's no self-doubt they understand what they need to do whereas if you throw too much at them their heads are going to be spinning no i think universally simplicity wins and what does yeah. simplicity look like depending on the levels is obviously a little bit uh wider maybe a little more complex but still simple right and as soon as you try to get cute you just end up confusing everybody let me pivot here to um what you've been able to take away from some of the minds you've been surrounded by right so obviously you've, you've worked for a couple of hall of famers uh yeah. you worked with the guy that's currently the the new coach of the raiders Right. You've got this uh, pedigree, so to speak. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of these mentors and what you've specifically been able to take away from them and apply to your own coaching journey and approach. I think I think Coach Edwards. Coach Edwards taught me the importance of, of just understanding your role and doing your job. That was something that he would always preach, kind of harp on constantly. Know your role, do your job, you know, just understand exactly what's expected of you. And do that to your best ability. I think, I think Coach Pierce, he he did a really good job of of influencing those guys to give max effort. He would always tell those guys, leave the tank empty. That would be a slide that he would put on his night before the game presentation. He'd put it on every single week. It would be, it would be a picture of a gas tank on E. And he would say, leave the tank empty. And we say we're building brick by brick every day. So just Kind of take your take your assignments. Don't do too much at once, but just you know take your take your journey one step at a time. Build your you know build your village brick by brick, and and then let everything kind of fall where it may. But I think those are the things that I learned from those two. And then Coach Satake, more than anything, he learned like what I've learned from him is just be a good person. Just you know carry yourself, um, you know to your best ability in and outside the building because. At the end of the day, we want to win with people. We don't want to win with the best five-star athlete that they may have, you know, some issues here or there. We want to win with people that want to be here and people that are willing to buy into the program and, and do good service in their community and then be good leaders in the classroom and the, on the football field. And, you know, I think, I think that's what I learned from him more so than anybody else to just be a good person, you know, be, be compassionate, be empathetic and always give your best and then demand the same out of your peers. What would you say you have learned from your athletes over the course of your coaching career, both back here and every stop you've made upon the way? Is there a couple of anecdotes you can share of where you had like a transformational moment that was almost reverse coaching? Yeah, I think... I don't want to say his name because I don't want to air him out, but there was a, there was somebody that I was, that I was uh, coaching at Stevenson who was a really good athlete and had all the ability in the world, but he would get a little down on himself at times. And there was one time where there was a turning point in the game where he had, you know, maybe had two or three drops and 
I kind of put my arm around him on the sideline and just kind of told him that, hey, we don't win without you. This team needs you. We're leaning on you. And we need your leadership and we need your fortitude to get through this game. I think that more so taught me that, you know, there's going to be highs and lows of a game, but it's just a matter of you kind of staying even keel, regardless of how good, how bad it may look or how it's going to turn out. You just need to give your max effort, continue to do your job, and then everything will fall into place in that regard. I think I I was just so used to, I mean, coming from Palman playing the position I played, I, I felt good about my assignments. I felt good about everything that was expected of me. And I thought that, I mean, I'm sure I could go back and see some mistakes that I made, but I thought that I was doing the like doing the right thing and then just kind of keeping your keeping your mental fortitude. I thought that was just kind of a given thing, but then I learned how there's different personalities that you're gonna be dealing with. Obviously, just like there are different personalities off the field, they're gonna to react to things differently on the field. So I just kind of more so managed, uh, learned how to manage personalities, uh, be personable and then just have have different approaches for for different people and I kind of figure out how to get the the best out of different different athletes different student athletes and I they respected me for making that attempt to you know relate to them and understand them you know on another level well I think that's very mature statement in regards to understanding that there are different personalities and you got to meet them where they are right you said you you want your athletes to be good people. You're 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 coaching people, right? And so yeah. there's an approach that's like I do this all the time, and they can adjust. And then there's fair is not equal, right? And yeah. so how do you uh, figure out what buttons to push, and what works for Wesley might not work for Evan, right? So how do you navigate that? And what are some uh, ways in which you've discovered that over the last few years uh, in regards to? a particular approach that was working or wasn't working and how you had to adjust? Well, I I strongly believe in positive reinforcement. So that was something that I kind of learned early on is you can't just, you can't just harp on them and yell at them and yell at them and, you know, expose them and embarrass them all the time. Like you're going to have to, you're going to, even if you do do that, you can't just leave that where it is. You're going to have to you're going to have to have a conversation with them after the fact. You're going to have to put your arm around them and kind of explain to them what the expectations are, what the standard is. And I think when you have those conversations with them outside of the sports setting, I think that they, that they have a better, they're, they're a little calmer and they have an opportunity to, to listen to you. And then I also think that I was doing a lot of talking and not a ton of listening early on. And I think once I kind of created that, uh, created that environment for an open dialogue and just became a better listener to those players, I was able to kind of adjust my approach and figure out the best way to to attend to them. So I think I became a better better speaker, a better coach when I became more attentive and and just started listening to them a little more. So I was able to you know, kind of cater my approach to, to each player. Yeah, no doubt. And again, that's a, an experienced skill that you've developed at a younger age. Uh, let me ask this. What have you most recently changed your mind on? Meaning I used to be dug in over here mm -hmm. and now I'm over here and here's why, right? What's mm -hmm. the growth mindset? Like, and I'm sure there's a number of different things, but things that uh, I got one you have front of mind. Yeah. So when I first got into it, I was like, man, the head coach sounds so fun. Head coach, head coach, head coach. That's what I want to do. I don't want to do that anymore as much. I don't want to do that right now, at least. You know, I feel like that could be subject to change as time changes because obviously your perspective change and your experience changes and all those things. But now that I'm a little more into it, a little deeper into it, I would much rather be in the role of a position coach or a coordinator just to give myself that opportunity to build those personal relationships and have my group of guys and then just focus on football and not have to do all the handshaking and baby kissing that comes with being the coach. I think, I think for me to be my best head coach, I think I need to go through those ranks and experience those things at different levels. So I like where I'm at right now. As an assistant coach in the corners room, I think that's a really good opportunity for me. And 
Coach Guilford does an awesome job. General Guilford, he does an awesome job of, you know, giving me opportunities to speak in the room and kind of building those skills and teaches me things off the field and teaches me technique. And I'm developing in that role. But I think, yeah, head coach, that's that's for later down the road. I like position coach and coordinator right now because it gives me an opportunity to pour into a you know a specific group of guys and then I can be more attentive to them and just kind of figure out, you know, where I need to, where I need to meet them. Whereas if I'm a head coach, you said you, you got to do all the PR stuff. You got to relate to 140 players, you know, in this time of year, we have 140 players right now. So you got to be able to do all those things and I can't be everywhere at once, but if I'm a position coach or a coordinator, I could be right where I'm at, have a good understanding of who my group is, and then I could just manage those personalities and players within that group with the coaches, if I'm a coordinator and the players. And then if I'm a position coach and I would just be managing those players and I would be able to pour, pour out, you know, my best to them if I, if I was in that role right now, but that's, yeah, I thought head coach all along and then I got into it and I was like, why did I think that? Well, because that's the natural progression as, Hey, this is where I want to go long-term and you're right you know, your timeline is going to be what your timeline is. But the one thing that you mentioned without mentioning is when you become the head coach, like you're not coaching football anymore. You're, yeah. you're, you're now not. running an organization. And so like, if you like coaching football, like take your time. Cause once yeah. you get <laughs> the higher you climb on the proverbial ladder there, the less coaching you actually get to do. Yeah. And I had no idea, you know, until I kind of got a chance, like I said, you, started at Stevenson and I was kind of given that opportunity to to have that exposure and see you know how things operate even at that level I mean I was like man Cass has to do everything and he's got to teach fourth grade and I'm like man, like he's got a lot on his plate and he's coaching O-line and we're going out there with 25 26 players doing a half line and he's playing left guard and I'm playing receiver and quarterback and I'm like man he's wearing a lot of hats right now like I my level of respect grew tremendously for head coaches once I got into it and kind of saw all the hats that the head coach has to wear. No doubt, no doubt. All right, man. Let me ask one more question here. Um, and and this yeah. is kind of my soapbox is what have you learned watching other sports that you've been able to apply to your coaching or to your athletes? Um, often I think in this era of sports specialization both athletes and coaches get tunnel vision. That's like, Oh, I can only learn from other football coaches, or I can only learn from other basketball coaches in my sense. And it's like, well, what's out there that's right around you that you could pick up on a day-to-day -day basis just by being curious while the tennis team is practicing. Yeah. I think, I think attention to detail is, is something that's honed in on at all sports. I think, I think sports, I mean, I'm a believer in sports complement each other. I think if you're in high school and you're an athlete, you should be playing as many sports as possible because you're giving yourself an opportunity to be exposed to these different sports. You're not beating down on your body, on one part of your body all year. You know, you're getting these opportunities. But I think one thing that carries over from sport to sport that I've seen is just attention to detail and then just will to win. Like winners are winners, regardless of, you know, what the sport is. I think having that confidence and, and just trusting in your preparation, regardless of what the sport is. I think that plays a big part in, you know, your level of success that you have on the field. So it's just a matter of, you know, you get, you get what you put into it. You know, you kind of have to invest in yourself and you're going to have to do some unfavorable things sometimes. Like you, you might want to hang out with your friends one weekend, but you, you might have to recover also. You might have to, you know, watch film or whatever the case is. So it's just, you know, kind of making those sacrifices, those time sacrifices and understanding that, you know, your day to day is not the same as, you know, a regular students day to day and just buying into that to the process of growth. I think that carries over to all sports and something that I've seen, you know, be applicable from, you know, from our basketball team, which is who just got a big win last night, you know, to our football team. And I think just togetherness and, and then just being bought in to the culture and the program and like I said, taking care of your body, that plays a big part in it too. Indeed, indeed. All right, I know it's late there. I'm going to let you get back to it. Thanks for being on today. Looking forward to seeing you when you get back out here to God's country. 
Appreciate it, man. August 